Hello, everyone. My name is Al Smith, and I'm the founder and director of Bishop Sheen today. I want to thank you for joining me for this Advent retreat as we go through the book, Lord Teach Us to Pray. And again, it is a collection of Archbishop Sheen's writings on prayer. And uh, we've been going through his uh, 1936 book, Calvary in the Mass, which is included in this anthology. And uh, again, he has been touching the lives of many of you uh, as we go through these passages together. And um, I think you're starting to see the formula uh, that was laid out in this book and how, if you follow along our reading guide, then it's found on our website, uh, bishopsheentoday.com. You can see how Fulton Sheen has produced a back to basics type approach. He starts with the Our Father and we review that because it is the prayer that we pray every day. And then of course he wants to challenge our mind and to uh, get us to think about our faith and what we believe in. Uh, he wants to encourage us to take up the spiritual battle and to know that we have to have a life of prayer and sacrifice. And we need to look into our soul each and every day. Of course, Fulton Sheen in his own way encourages us. And of course, he gives us the Blessed Mother as a companion, a guide, a source of strength. And now he is revealing to us the beauty of the Mass. Again, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life. And of course, the value of the Mass, I, I can't say enough about that. And that's what we've been unpackaging this week, is Sheen's writings on the Mass. And so uh, today we're going to study the reflection, uh, Ita Misa S. Uh, I guess the Latin translation is, the Mass is ended, and, uh, but uh, it is finished. And so we're going to uh, unpackage a little bit of Sheen's wisdom today. And we'll also end our reflection with a prayer, as we always do each day. And it will be a universal prayer. And I think you'll enjoy this um, selection. Now, I'll bring up onto the screen uh, today's uh, passage. And uh, as you have noticed, uh, these passages don't take that long. And I want to thank everyone who has been listening on, uh, again, our Podbean platform, uh, iTunes, uh, those who are following along with the audio portion of this during this Advent retreat. So uh, thank you for joining us. So again, Fulton Sheen in 1936, um, again, this book, Calvary and the Mass, um, sold tens of thousands of copies and continues to uh, be, be a very popular book, even though a lot of people may say, well, oh, that was the Latin Mass, and uh, we don't see it as much, uh, maybe as we'd like to, but um, I think it still applies very much to today's Mass. I think you'll see the connection, uh, but I think what Fulton Sheen really wants to emphasize is how that the Mass is Calvary reenacted. Our Lord's seven last words apply so beautifully to the seven parts of the Mass. And in today's reflection, the Ita Misa Est will tie in to the words of our Lord, it is finished. And so let me share with you Fulton Sheen's wisdom. Our blessed Savior now comes to the Ita Misa Est of his Mass. As he utters the cry of triumph, it is finished. The work of salvation is finished, but when did it begin? It began back in the agelessness of eternity, when God willed to make man. Ever since the beginning of the world, there was a divine impatience to restore man to the arms of God. The word was impatient in heaven to be the lamb slain from the beginning of the world. He was impatient in prophetic types and symbols, and his dying face was reflected in a hundred mirrors stretching through all Old Testament history. He was impatient to be the real Isaac, carrying the wood of his sacrifice in obedience to the commands of his heavenly Abraham. He was impatient to fulfill the mystical symbol of the Lamb of the Jewish Pash, 
who was slain without a single bone of its body being broken. He was impatient to be the new Abel, slain by his jealous brethren of the race of Cain, that his blood might cry to heaven for forgiveness. He was impatient in his mother's womb as he saluted his precursor, John. He was impatient in the circumcision as he anticipated his bloodshedding and receiving the name of Savior. He was impatient at the age of 12 as he reminded his mother that he had to be about his father's business. He was impatient in his public life as he said he had been uh, had a baptism wherewith he was to be baptized and he was straight, straightened until it be accomplished. He was impatient in the garden as he turned his back to the consoling 12 legions of angels, to crimson olive roots with his redemptive blood. He was impatient at his last supper as he anticipated the separation of his body and blood under the appearance of bread and wine. And then impatience closed as the hour of darkness drew near at the end of that last supper, he sang. It was a trivial matter for the world if the stars burned brightly or the mountains stood as symbols of perplexity or the hills made their tribute to valleys which gave them birth. What was important was that every single word predicted of him should be true. Heaven and earth would not pass away until every jot and title had been fulfilled. There was only a little iota remaining, one tiny little jot. It was David's word about every prediction being fulfilled. Now that all else was fulfilled, he fulfilled that quota. He, the true David, quoted the prophet David. It is finished. What is finished? The redemption of man is finished? Love had completed its mission, for love had done all that it could. There are two things love can do. Love, by its very nature, tends to an incarnation, and every incarnation tends to a crucifixion. Does not all true love tend toward an incarnation? In the order of human love, does not the affection of husband for wife create from their mutual loves the incarnation of their confluent love in the form of a child? Once they have begotten their child, do not they make their sacrifices for him, even to the point of death? And thus their love tends to a crucifixion. But this is just a reflection of the divine order, where the love of God for man was so deep and intense that it ended in an incarnation which found God in the form and habit of man, whom he loved. But our Lord's love for man did not stop with the incarnation. Unlike everyone else who was ever born, our Lord came into this world to redeem it. Death was the supreme goal he was seeking. Death interrupted the careers of, of great men, but it was no interruption to our Lord it was his crowning glory. It was the unique goal he was seeking. His incarnation thus intended to, to the crucifixion. For greater love than this no man has that he lay down his life for his friends. Now that love had run its course in the redemption of man, divine love could say, I have done all for my vineyard that I could do. Love can do no more than die. It is finished. Ita Misa Est. His work is finished, but is ours? When he said it is finished, he did not mean that the opportunities of his life had ended. He meant that his work was done so perfectly that nothing could be added to it to make it more perfect. But with us, how seldom that is true. Too many of us end our lives 
but few of us see them finished. A sinful life may end, but a sinful life is never a finished life. If our lives just end, our friends will ask, how much did he leave? But if our lives are finished, our friends will ask, how much did he take with him? A finished life is not measured by years, but by deeds. Not by the time spent in the vineyard, but by the work done. In a short time, a man may fulfill many years. Even those who come at the 11th hour may finish their lives. Even those who come to God like the thief at the last breath may finish their lives in the kingdom of God. Not for them the sad word of regret. Too late, O ancient beauty, have I loved thee. Those great words of St. Augustine. Our Lord finished his work, but we have not finished ours. He pointed out the way we must follow. He laid down the cross at the finish, but we must take it up. He finished redemption in his physical body, but we have not finished it in his mystical body. He has finished salvation. We have not yet applied it to our souls. He has finished the temple, but we must live in it. He has finished the model cross. We must fashion ours to its pattern. He has finished sowing the seed. We must reap the harvest. He has finished filling the chalice, but we have not finished drinking its refreshing drafts. He has planted the wheat field. We must gather it into our barns. He has finished the sacrifice of Calvary. We must finish the Mass. The crucifixion was not meant to be an inspirational drama, but a pattern act on which to model our lives. We are not meant to sit and watch the cross as something done and end it, like the life of Socrates. What was done on Calvary avails for us only in the degree that we repeat it in our own lives. The Mass makes this possible, for at the renewal of Calvary on our altars, we are not onlookers, but sharers in the redemption. And there it is that we finish our work. He told us, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. He finished his work when he was lifted up on the cross. We finish ours when we permit him to draw us unto himself in the Mass. The Mass is that which makes the cross visible to every eye. It placards the cross at all the crossroads of civilization. It brings Calvary so close that even tired feet can make the journey to its sweet embrace. Every hand may now reach out to touch its sacred burden and every ear may hear its sweet appeal, for the Mass and the cross are the same. In both, there is the same offering of a perfectly surrendered will of the beloved Son, the same body broken, the same blood flowing forth, the same divine forgiveness. All that has been said and done and acted during Holy Mass is to be taken away with us, lived, practice and woven into all the circumstances and conditions of our daily lives. His sacrifice is made our sacrifice by making it the oblation of ourselves in union with him. His life given for us becomes our life given for him. Thus do we return from mass as those who have made their choice, turn their backs upon the world and become other Christ for the generation in which we live, living potent witness to the love that died, that we might live with love. The world is full of ours. Let me say that again. The world of ours is full of half-completed Gothic cathedrals, of half-finished lives and half-crucified souls. 
Some carry the cross to Calvary and then abandon it. Others are nailed to it and detach themselves before the elevation. Others are crucified, but in answer to the challenge of the cross and the world, come down. They come down after one hour, after two hours, after two hours and 59 minutes. Real Christians are they who persevere until the end. Our Lord stayed until he had finished. The priest must likewise stay at the altar until the Mass is finished. He may not come down. So we must stay with the cross until our lives are finished. Christ on the cross is the pattern and model of a finished life. Our human nature is the raw material. Our will is the chisel. God's grace is the energy and the inspiration. Touching the chisel to our unfinished nature, we first cut off huge chunks of selfishness. Then by more delicate chiseling, we dig away smaller bits of egotism until finally only a brush of the hand is needed to bring out the completed masterpiece, a finished man made to the image and likeness of the pattern on the cross. We are at the altar under the symbol of bread and wine. We have offered ourselves to our Lord. He has consecrated us. We must therefore not take ourselves back, but remain there until the end, praying unceasingly that when the lease of our life has ended and we look back upon a life lived in intimacy with the cross, the echo of the sixth word may ring out on our own lips. It is finished. And as the sweet accents of the Ita Missa Est reach beyond the corridors of time and pierce the hid battlements of eternity, the angel choirs and the white Rome army of the church triumphant will answer back, Deo Gratias. I love when the priest says, the mass is ended, let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And what Fulton Sheen is saying here is, let's finish our life well. Uh, we have work to do. We haven't completed the mission yet. We have work to finish. And uh, of course, our Lord leads by example. He finished his mission. He completed the task that God the Father gave him and he laid down his life for us. And so let us learn from his example. Let us lay down our lives for our friends, for our family. Let us continue to be, uh, I like to say, as Fulton Sheen would write about priest and victim. Sometimes we have to be a little bit of a victim and offer ourselves up. But again, it is finished. Those beautiful words of our Lord as a holy inspiration for us. All right, let us uh, conclude with uh, a meditation today, a beautiful prayer. And uh, again, the book, Lord Teach Us to Pray, has a whole section of prayers. And uh, many of these prayers are very appropriate for our spiritual battle that we face each day. Uh, this prayer today, a universal prayer, was composed by uh, Pope Clement. And um, again, I think it will touch your heart. So please join me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh my God, I believe in Thee. Do Thou strengthen my faith. All my hopes are in Thee. Do Thou secure them. I love Thee with my whole heart. Teach me to love Thee daily more and more. I am sorry that I have offended Thee. Do Thou increase my sorrow. I adore thee as my first beginning. I aspire after thee as my last end. I give thee thanks as my constant benefactor. I call upon thee as my sovereign protector. Vouchsafe, O oh my God, to conduct me in thy wisdom, to restrain me by thy justice, to comfort me by thy mercy, to defend me by thy power. To thee I desire to consecrate all my thoughts, 
words, actions, and sufferings, that henceforth I may think of thee, speak of thee, constantly refer of all my actions to thy greater glory, and suffer willingly whatever thou shall appoint. Lord, I desire in all things that thy will may be done, because it is thy will in the manner thou willest, and for as long as, as willest. I beg of thee to enlighten my understanding, to inflame my will, to purify my body and to sanctify my soul. Grant that I may, grant that I be not puffed up with pride, moved by flattery, deceived by the world, or duped by the devil. Give me grace to purify my memory, to bridle my tongue, to restrain my eyes and to mortify my senses. Give me strength, O oh my God, to expiate my offenses, to overcome my temptations, to subdue my passions and to acquire the virtues proper for my state. Fill my heart with a tender affection for the goodness, a hatred for my faults, a love for my neighbor, and a contempt for the world. Let me always remember to be submissive to my superiors, patient with my inferiors, faithful to my friends, and charitable to my enemies. Grant, O Jesus, that I may remember thy precept and example by loving my enemies, bearing with injuries, doing good to those who persecute me, and praying for those who slander me. Assist me to overcome sensuality by mortification, avarice by alms deeds, anger by meekness, and tepidity by devotion. O oh my God, make me prudent in my undertakings, courageous in dangers, patient in afflictions, and humble in prosperity. Grant that I may be ever attentive in my prayers, temperament at meals, diligent in employments, and constant in good resolutions. Let my conscience be ever upright and pure, my exterior modest, my conversations edifying, and my life according to rule. Assist me that I may continually labor to overcome nature, to correspond with thy grace, to keep thy commandments and to work out my salvation. Help me to obtain holiness of life by a sincere confession of my sins, by a devout reception of the body of Christ, by a continual recollection of my mind, and by a pure intention of heart. Reveal to me, O oh my God, the nothingness of this world, the greatness of heaven, the shortness of time, and the length of eternity. Grant that I may prepare for death, that I may fear thy judgments, that I may escape hell, and in the end obtain heaven, to the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That was a great prayer, the universal prayer uh, from Pope Clement, Clement XI. Um, I love that. I love that. I'm going to use that more often in my prayer life. Everyone, thank you for joining us for this um, a day of reflection during our Advent retreat. And so I'd ask you to invite a friend and, um, of course, uh, please pick up a copy of the book, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And uh, until next time, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you kindly and bring you peace. God love you.